and the basic transportation thing there a little bit. Um, hopefully, when you're in a capacity as as a person as a Contra Prairie or as a master naturalist somewhere, uh, you'd probably be involved in some stream surveys, perhaps, or maybe in fishing clinics or another way where you get a lot of interaction um, with fish. We're going to fish, believe it or not, are one of the most numerous vertebrates on the planet. Um, um, so there's between an estimate of 25,000 and 40,000 fish species. Um, that's, a, that's a huge group. So they are very numerous. And, but Kansas is home to about 135 species of fish, 116 which are native. That number does fluctuate a little bit. We actually, unfortunately, have more non-natives coming into our, into our waters every year. We get to introduce species that uh, are not desirable. So you will see that number fluctuate a little bit. And unfortunately, there are a few of our native fish species that are on the, on the decline, as you can imagine. And uh, actually, in, in many cases, probably are already extirpated from the state, but um, a little bit soon to call that. 19 of those fish species have been introduced already. And, uh, but there is no species of fish that lives only in Kansas. However, here's the caveat, there are more kinds of fish that occur naturally here than in any other state further west or directly north of us. So, East and south have more, but north and west do not. So that's a uh, hoorah for Kansas. Um, whoops, that was kind of a. We're going to talk about when we look at the groups of fishes, there's a super class of fishes called Agnatha, but these are the without jaws. They lack paired appendages and they're very primitive, the most primitive of the living fishes. And, and the lampreys are an example. Um, and in Kansas, we have just one species, it's called the chestnut lamprey. But it's already, as I said, it's believed to be extirpated. I think the last one of any record was in 1987. No one's seen, seen one since in, the, uh, in surveys and things, so not looking real good for that. But these guys have a round mouth with a raspy tongue, and they feed their parasite. They feed on the tissue and blood of their prey. And uh, what's really cool about them is, as larvae, they live in freshwater streams, but they migrate to the sea as an adult. So, kind of cool there. Hagfishes are another relative of them, and these guys um, live entirely in salt water, so no chance of finding any hagfishes in Kansas. But still, part of that super class, I can have the most primitive of fishes. The next class of fish you're familiar with, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with these guys, sharks, rays, and their relatives. Again, you're not going to see any of these guys in Kansas, however, um, Kansas is a great place to find fossil shark teeth because of the ocean that Kansas once was. And uh, so we do see a lot of fossil shark teeth. The jaws and the paired fins are well developed in this group. And we all, there's what's, but what's kind of interesting and a neat little factoid about congregate these is that they, skeletons, are made of cartilage. They don't actually have any bone in their body. Um, so that makes them, again, more primitive than. And there are about a thousand living species, and of course, none live in Kansas, and the foxes are keeping their common. But now we come to this class called Osteichthyes, but this is basically the bony fishes. This is where we're the most familiar with them. We've got two groups, though, within the bony fishes. There's the lobe fin fishes, which are actually, believe it or not, these guys are the ancestors to all the terrestrial tetrapods or amphibians. Um, the low fin fishes are, sometimes you see them, um, they are coelacanth, what's pictured up there on top is a coelacanth, and sometimes you hear about those being pulled out of really deep lakes in Africa, um, and they're an odd little, can you meet them all the way down? I'm trying to take them down. Sure, go behind here. And it's a little, little hard to see. I, well, thanks for telling me, right here, I'll just shut them off. There, there we go, that's a little better. Yeah, with all the light coming into the windows. Ah, oh, the red stuff is washing out. Okay. So um, the long fishes and the coelacanths are groups of this this group, and they are all freshwater. And then they are found. They're not found in North America, but they're found in Africa, South America, and Australia. These are some of the ones that uh, we see. Very primitive. But now we come to what we know as a fish here in Kansas. They're technically called ray fin fishes. 
So their, ray, their fins are supported by long, flexible rays. Sometimes they have spines included in those but that poke like a catfish. But uh, those fins, of course, are good for maneuvering, and they have other functions, too. The fins is part of that. But these are the ones we are the most familiar with, everything from bass and trout and perch and tunas in the sea and herring. These are all fish that belong to this group called the ray fin fishes. And they are the most numerous of all the vertebrates, vertebrate classes, about 24,000 species. And they occur in habitats wherever fish occur, anywhere from three miles above the sea level to seven miles beneath it. So very diverse habitats that they inhabit, uh, very well adapted to all kinds of aquatic situations. So it's a big group, 24,000 species, you can expect to find them virtually everywhere. But these are just the basic bony fish characteristics. They've got a skeleton made of bone. Now you, everybody, you know, anytime you've ever filleted a fish or eaten a piece of fish and gotten a little bone in your mouth, um, well aware of the fact that fish have bones. These fish have bones and they tend, tend to be fairly tiny. Um, they have a skin covered by scales. They have glands in the skin that create mucus um, that helps to reduce drag when they're swimming. They have a lateral line. They breathe with gills and they have a swim bladder. And uh, parts of the fish that they, we're all pretty familiar with that, um, that the different external anatomy of the fish. Fins, just real quickly, they may be paired, as you guess, the pectoral fins and the pelvic fins are the paired fins on a fish, and then there's unpaired fins, the, the tail fin, the anal fin, the caudal fin, and the dorsal fin don't have pairs elsewhere on the body. So some fish have all of these fins, and some fish have just a few of them. And, but what's interesting, when you get into trying to identify fish, this is where it comes in pretty handy. Looking at the placement of the fins will tell you a lot about the fish and where it lives. And it also helps aid in identification because uh, fin placement and, and structure of the fin is one of those characteristics that's often found in a key that you might be turning to in order to identify a fish. Um, this, as you can guess, the pelvic and pectoral fins are like arms and legs in mammals. And so um, they use them. They might extend outward like oars, like in the sunfish, they use them for maneuvers. They might be stubby and kind of point down, like in the darters, um, and that holds the fish down in strong currents. So those are some clues to their, so those positions can give you clues about where they, where they live. Anyway, fish shapes, the best shape to be a fish living in water, because water is much denser than air, you want to be fusiform or torpedo shaped. That's the one that overcomes this thickness and stickiness of water. So that's the ideal shape. And the fastest fish are this shape, like the tunas, the mackerels, the white sharks. That's the ideal shape. But not all fish are that shape. Um, fish have different shapes. And so fish that range through the depths in pools and, and lakes have this compressed body. Like, And this is, again, real familiar to us in Kansas, bluegill, panfish, some of those. They are flattened from side to side. Um, that's the shape of bluegill. The depressed is flattened like a catfish. This keeps them against the, the bottom, uh, helps them stay down, uh, with the water flowing over their back. And then you've got this long, attenuated shape, which is kind of like a cigar. And the fish that live near the surface have that kind of a shape. And the gar is a perfect example of that. And they kind of hang out at the top of the water. Um, then you've got the walleye, which has this kind of a spindle shape, and that lets them move through the water with some with a little less resistance. And then the long limp bodies of things like eels or matoms allow them to wiggle in among the crevices of the rocks. So those are a couple of other shapes. And then the ultimate, how many people have seen the most extreme shape is probably the flatfishes. I don't know if you've seen the flounders and the, and the sole and the halibuts. And, uh, and what's really cool about the flounder is they start off like a normal fish. If you've ever seen a larval flounder, um, they have their, um, have eyes on both sides of their head, but they, they migrate. The eye, actually, one eye migrates to the top of the head. And they're a left-handed sole and they're a right-handed sole. There's a difference. You know? but, so that eye migrates to the top. And then they become, they're both flattened dorsally, they're depressed and compressed. They're compressed first and then they're depressed this way. So um, they truly have a very unique shape among, among vertebrates. 
really cool. But none of those in Kansas, sorry. Uh, so this, the, the shape of the fish is kind of a compromise between feeding and staying alive and locomotion. And, and so, again, I'm just stressing the shape of the fish can give you a lot of clues about where it lives, especially if it's a fish you've never seen before. This is some clues for you to look at. The fin, the tail fin is, these are some different shapes you'll find. Uh, continuous collar fin, like you see in the eels. Um, again, good for swimming in and around cracks and crevices. That uh, dorsal collar and anal fin are all one fin that's attached. Then you've got the fork tails. These are good for fish that swim continuously. Fish that have a lunate collar fin, kind of half moon shape, those belong to those fastest fish again. They're good for endurance, they're good for uh, maintaining speed. And then you have two shapes that are for strong swimmers, but slow usually. That's the truncate and the rounded. Those two shapes kind of suggest that they're, they're strong swimmers, but they're not particularly fast. Trying to be good at that. Scales and skin. Um, scales look like shingles on a roof. But uh, and there are several types of scales in fish. There's some are thick and hard, like armor. If you've ever had a gar in your hands or ever tried to clean a gar. When I was in college, in graduate school, you know, we were poor like lots of graduate students. And we would go catch gar and eat them. And we thought they were great because we could catch them insane. And, uh, but it took an ax to clean them because they have armor. They have those very thick scales on their uh, platoid scales that are very hard to cut through, and uh, so that's one. And then a few fish, like catfish and paddlefish, don't have any scales on their body. Um, but the, one of the interesting things about scales is that you can actually age a fish by looking at the growth rings on a scale. The scale is bone, the, the, the bone is laid down, just like uh, tissue in a tree ring is laid down in a yearly pattern. And so what a fisheries biologist is going to do, one of the Sampling techniques that they employ when they're out netting fish is they're going to take a weight, they're going to take a measurement, a length measurement, a weight of the fish, and they're going to pull a scale sample. And they're going to go back in and they're going to read those, the growth pattern on those scales. They're going to be able to, to determine if that fish is growing quickly, uh, what year class it is. Um, they're going to be able to, you know, if they've got a really big fish with something like three years old, then they know that they have been feeding very well and they've grown very quickly. Maybe they're uh, a small fish that's seven or eight years old and they look like they should be a two-year-old fish. Well, then you get a clue that there must not be much for that fish to eat. You may, you may have an imbalance there. You may have a problem in that body of water and then you try to adjust. That's what hatcheries are all about is we try to supplement um, fish populations when there's a bad year class or when there are a lot of fish being caught in a particular uh, of a species, then hatcheries step in and try to, to up those numbers. But so you can you can read the scales, you can read the growth rings on a scale, and you can tell how old a fish is. And you can also, there are a few other places on a fish that grow in rings. Um, drum have a, a otolith in their ear that also can be cross-sectioned, and, and catfish have a spine. Catfish don't have any scales on their body, so they can't pull a scale, but you can pull the spine on their pectoral um, fin, and it's, it sounds like it would be gruesome and, and hurt the fish, but they actually sort of have a locking mechanism. If you push in and turn, um, you could pull that bone out. It, it does rip along the fin because it is attached, but it doesn't hurt the fish in any permanent way. And uh, then you can slice that into little cross sections and get that same scale pattern. Or 